formal keynote lecture, but we will have a conversation between our keynote speaker, Kafui or Kaf uh, Tsirasa, who is MD PhD. He, uh, Dr. Tsirasa, received his undergraduate training at University of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, uh, Maryland, Baltimore County, where he was a Meyerhoff scholar. He then joined uh, Duke University's MD PhD program, uh, where he was the first African American to complete a PhD in neurobiology. He graduated from the MD-PhD program in 2009 and sort of taking a rather unusual career path. He then, at the time of graduation, he was appointed assistant professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences and at the same time began his postgraduate training in psychiatry. He received, he was obviously an extremely uh, accomplished individual. He received numerous awards during his doctoral training, including the Somjian Award for Most Outstanding Dissertation, thesis, the Ruth K. Broad Biomedical Research Fellowship, UNCF Merck Graduation Science Research Fellowship, and a few others. And he was recognized while he was still a student by as, um, Ebony Magazine's 30 Young Leaders in the Future. Uh, so uh, he, he did a lot while he was a student in the program, sets an example for everybody else. So Dr. Chirasi's current research uh, focuses uh, on improving the outcomes for individuals who suffer from neurological and psychiatric disorders, where he, his, he and his laboratory strives to understand the molecular underpinnings for serious human disease using an impressive array of molecular and cellular methods, some of them you have heard in various versions of by the students who have talked today. But in addition to his research, Dr. Sirasa is deeply involved in activities that um, sort of related in a more <coughs> broad sense to the eradication of health disparities. He, while he was an uh, MD-PhD student, he served on the board of directors of the Student National Medical Association, and he has continued his involvement in these activities since then. And not surprisingly, therefore, uh, in his postgraduate career, Dr. Rasa has received many national awards. He received the International Mental Health Research Organization's Rising Star Award, the Sydney Spear Prize for Schizophrenia Research, and the Presidential Early, Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. In uh, 2011, his laboratory was focused on, uh, featured as CPS 60 Minutes, and he was the inaugural Duke Medical Alumni Emerging Leader Awardee in 2016. And so, uh, and remember, all of this was while he was both assistant professor and uh, a resident in psychiatry, at least in the early part of these activities. So today, Dr. Tsirasa will be joined of one of his current MD-PhD students, Dalton Hughes, who also is a graduate of the Meyerhoff program at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And they will jointly discuss what it means to be a physician scientist. So we very much look forward to hear your conversation and please come up. Well, I guess good morning. We've got a couple of minutes left in the morning. It's, it's a tremendous honor to be here. We probably won't sit down. Oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> we'll stand up. Um, so Ruth reached out to me uh, maybe six, seven, eight weeks ago now. Um, and, and told me about the wonderful program and the work that you were doing here. Uh, she told me about the amazing students and the family members and asked if I'd be willing to come down and give a, a keynote. And I've, I'd sort of been zipping around the country uh, a lot <laughs> in um, the last year and a half especially. And I said, you know, I, the main theme uh, that I want to impress on people is the importance of like mentoring, right, and, and supporting and nurturing people. And like, it's really hard to do that if I keep, like, leaving my lab. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I asked Ruth, I said, you know, 
the only way I'd be able to do this is if I was able to mentor while I was here, if I could bring one of my students um, who's equally as impressive and is on a, a career trajectory that, that is way out in, in front of mine. And I said, if I could sort of like come and do mentoring from the stage, um, I'm sort of like a show one that I learned by seeing things and, and touching them. So if I could like show you mentoring and show you someone being mentored and them also being awesome and exceptional, and then we can all do that and make it all work on the same exact same time, then I can make this work. And her response was, I have no idea how you're going to pull that off. <laughs> My response was, I have no idea how we're going to pull that off. So we're going to try this. We're going to do this totally extemporaneously. Dalton and I have done about 30 seconds of prep, which is, let's get up there and don't make me look bad. <laughs> and, and so I'll tell you about Dalton, and Dalton will tell you about me. And in this, um, I, I hope that it'll give you a good visual picture of the type of mentor that you would be striving for, the type of mentee that you should be nurturing as you're developing in, in your career. And I hope it'll give you a strong indication of how critical mentoring is. There are a lot of things in your scientific development that are going to be necessary, but not sufficient, right? So we always talk about things that you have to have. So having a good mentor is not sufficient. There are things you're gonna have to bring to the table. Don't, we'll talk about those things. But I want you to understand how critical mentoring is. Like being smart, being talented, and working hard is simply not sufficient. And I don't want to give you the impression that it is, because you'll go into a scenario without good mentoring, and then you'll wonder why things aren't meant working. So I want you to understand how critical the role a mentor plays, and, and you should see this. So Dalton was a sophomore at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, where I did my undergrad years, and I got a phone call. And the phone call was from one of my mentors, who said, I've got this kid, you know, he's a little lost, but he's really smart. Um, and I think he'd be great for you, right? He's like, he, he, you know, again, he's a little lost. He's a little green, right? He's smart. Um, and maybe if you can figure out how to, like, get him down there and spend some time with it, we can make him into something, right? So, so it's funny. When your mentors say that, right, they always want you to join with them. So this was one of my mentors who wanted me to join with them on a project. In this case, it wasn't a scientific project. It was the young, uh, I call him the young Dr. Hughes. And so Dalton shows up in my lab. He was a chemical engineering major. And I knew the one thing that was important, I'd mentored several people, was that if you want to, to give people a course or direction of their life, you have to challenge them. But it's very important to give people an opportunity to be successful early on. Right? And so you can challenge people in ways that are discouraging or encouraging. And I knew Dalton's skill set. I knew that he had no idea what neuroscience was. By this point in time, I had a neuroscience laboratory. I knew he was an engineer. And so I developed a project for him at the interface of engineering and neuroscience, where I knew it would be hard, but he, he had an opportunity to be successful. And I knew if he could both taste success, right? So, so you know, like you work really hard, and then when something works, it's it's super addictive when something works. You keep you keep chasing that feeling. So I wanted him to have that, but I also wanted him to go to a place where he felt like he would fit in, right? And my lab is like different. My lab is like me. I look like I don't belong in most of the environments I'm in. Both it's a visual representation. It's also also an experiential thing. And I wanted him to see an environment in which there was high quality science that was being done, but that he could see himself in it as a reflection of that. So that's the introduction to Dalton. Hello, everybody. Um, so to paint a quick little picture, and I think this will resonate more with the undergrads here, is that when I had that conversation with you, uh, Dr. Dras's mentor and also the University of Maryland Baltimore County's president, they just said, you know, you have to meet this guy, have a nice conversation, and see where that goes. Um, so at the time, I said, who is he? What's going on? What do I need to do? And so the president actually pulled out the letter of recommendation that was written by Dr. Dross's uh, faculty advisor during his PhD. And he just went through all of the accolades, pretty much just like how he was introduced today. And during that entire time, I was like, OK, I have to meet him. I don't know what I'm going to do, but let's just, I'm going to give him a call and see where this takes me. Um, when I made that call, he very quickly went through it. Are you a hard worker? What's your math skills like? Are you, you know what, why don't you come down this summer and see what you know, where you can go with this. And so I got very excited, but in also incredibly nervous because I didn't know how I was going to navigate this. Um, he shows up on campus not too long, a couple of weeks afterwards, pulls up and says, hey, uh, let's grab lunch and then we can talk a little bit and prep you for the summer. All right, I get into the car and we're driving down the road and he's blasting hip hop music. <laughs> uh, we're all listening to the new Drake album at the time. Uh, we show up on this, uh, this kind of Chinese carryout, and we're eating greasy Chinese food and just looking at this, this uh, PowerPoint presentation. 
Um, and very quickly, I realized that this is someone I needed to, to, to talk with. This is someone that very quickly broke down that sort of weird social and professional hierarchy and just said, okay, listen, we're gonna do really great research this summer, and if you're interested, just come on down, we'll make this work. Don't worry about the requirements, don't worry about any of that. Let's see if we can get some good science done. And that really focused my attention to the work that's being done in the lab, and especially that now I don't have to be nervous that, that I had to stand up and say, okay, you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing here all the time, you know, because he knew that I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and throughout that entire summer, I, I, the most important thing was that I had to show up. I had to show up every morning, ready to roll, ready to learn, and ready to fail. And throughout that, there's an understanding that I had with Kaf was that you don't know what you're doing, but if you keep trying and you keep trying to learn, you keep taking steps forward every single day, you learn just a little bit. And that little bit of consistent learning was what allows for you to, to move a lot further when you look back at that summer experience. So throughout that entire summer, I basically failed every single day, um, at least to myself. You know, I, was, I was, didn't know that I was learning a lot of statistical uh, techniques as well as a lot of engineering that was actually on a graduate school and postdoc level. But to me, these were things that I should have known before I showed up, so I treated it as such. Um, and then at the end of the summer, I came back to Kaf and I said, well, I really enjoyed this, but what's the deal with the whole MD-PhD thing? Um, throughout the, the entire experience, he he came in at random hours during the day. Okay, so I'm going to cut Don. Oh, okay, right? okay. <laughs> Don's trying to take over the keynote now. <laughs> I, I've trained him well, right? You get the mic, you do not give it away. So, so Don's right. He did a fantastic job during the summer. The project was um, really at a late graduate school, early postdoc level. And, and to give you an indication of this, right? So Dalton thought he was like doing an okay average job. Um, the work he did ended up the basis of two publications. Um, and one of those, so he finished the first project. I put him on a second project just because I like didn't want to spend all day talking to him in the lab. So I sort of gave him stuff to do. And that project, funny enough, became the basis of my R1. <laughs> and, and, and so to give you an indica indication of how far out this is, um, this R1, it's the big research grant um, that you get from NIH when you sort of like figured out how to be a faculty member, right? So these things have funding rates on the order of 10%. The average age for an MD, PhD getting their first one of these is about 44 years old. So I was able to get my while I was running a lab as a resident at 34. And so it gives you an indication of the quality of how far out the work that he was doing um, and the environment that we got into. So he's asking me about this MD-PhD thing. And I give him the advice that I give everybody who wants to do an MD-PhD. And I'll give you guys the same advice today. Um, take it with a grain of salt. It'll be a little bit different than what you've heard before. I said, don't do it. Why would anyone do these like two degrees simultaneously? This makes no sense whatsoever. So I spent all of my time trying to talk people out of these things. And if at the end of that, they still want to do it, I write them the best letter of recommendation ever. Turns out this has been the best way of getting people into MD PhD programs. Despite everything I say, everyone looks and they say, but you look like you're having so much fun. And that becomes the greatest thing that encourages people to go after this. When you see of the life that you want, it doesn't matter what anybody tells you. It doesn't matter what the obstacles are. And, and I found in this, and, and I'll talk about this some more as we get into his medical school, that it's actually the best way of preparing people for the advers adversity that you're gonna run into, right? These challenges in succeeding at this level comes along with a lot of problems and a lot of adversity that you have to overcome. And I found that when I give people that clear message, they get over that stuff right, real, much faster than I did, right? So they, they have their own set of experiences, but they also have the benefit of all of my experiences of failing multiple times over. So I told him not to do the MD, PhD. Don't he listens to me about a third of the time. Um, the other 60% of the time, he's right. Uh, and, and he decided he wanted to do an MD-PhD. And so he applied to programs he got in. And his uh, choice, his final decision, was between Duke and Case Western. And I gave him no advice on where to go. Yeah, so um, after the application process, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out, okay, Case has all these great programs. I've got family nearby. and I found a couple of research mentors that would be fantastic for me. And then I came down for a second look at Duke University, and I had an amazing time down there. Um, I was able to travel down there and see all the wide range of things that I can do. The faculty members were really nice, and also I could easily work with Kaf again um, in the same, this sort of research topic that I had never really had experience to prior to that, and it was really, really interesting. 
um, when I finally figured it out, it, it just kind of dawned on me is that North Carolina is awesome. <laughs> it had, you know, it was low cost of living. It was just a fun place to be. And also, it was just allowed for me to continue making connections that I had fostered throughout those summer research experiences. Um, and so I, again, started to question things, saying, OK, let me get into, look, once I get into medical school, things will start to make sense. Because his life doesn't make any sense. And I didn't, you know, I wanted to see if I could do this and still kind of track and make sure, look, okay, I'll have these roadblocks that I got to do. This is all seems like chaos, but let me see if I can create a path here. It seems to be once you start medical school, that all falls out of the window. <laughs> um, med school, no matter what, it's, they say that it's like drinking water, um, water from a fire hydrant. Um, and very quickly, I started to realize, like, hey, man, I don't know what's going on here, but I wasn't ready for any of this. And so then, I guess, Kopp started to then impart the same sort of experience that he had, that it is hard, and you just have to, you know, you have to buckle up and, and just do the work. And things will start to make sense eventually. And I didn't believe him. I just, just honestly just did not believe any part of that, in that I see students you know, coming through, and they had all these interesting plans, and said, this is how it's going to work out for me. I'm going to go to med school, and yada, 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 boom, faculty position. And it just didn't, I didn't see how you can even start to integrate the research with the medical sciences whatsoever. So, so he's, he's, he, he's getting excited, and he's telling this story in a very flowery way, right? So <laughs> I, I was a chemical engineering major, which means in undergrad, you were taught never to memorize things, ever. Right? The professors knew how to write exams, that if they could tell you'd memorize anything, you would always get it wrong. So I went into medical school, um, and I had no idea how medical school worked, but I remember trying to convince all my classmates, never memorize it. Like, you don't have to memorize all this stuff. There's no way they want you to know all these like, terms and words and like, kinases and phosphatases. I didn't know what they were. Like, it, was just, it was a hot mess for me. Right. It, it first year of medical school was really bad. So I knew Dalton was coming from a chemical engineering background. So I said, Dalton, you know, like, you might want to, like, memorize everything. And it doesn't, like, <laughs> and you're always going to be starting behind because for some people, they've seen this stuff for four years and you're not going to know this language and it's going to be hard. And Dalton's, like, always positive, right? He's like, oh, don't worry, cop. It's going to be great. <laughs> And so when he came down to Duke, um, it, it, my wife, um, we sort of like mentor people together, right? So my wife uh, thinks of Dalton as a little brother. So sometime around like January, we hadn't seen Dalton for a while, right? And we would see Dalton like every couple of weeks, we'd go out to dinner. We hadn't seen Dalton like middle of his first year of medical school. And I'm like walking down the hall one day in the medical school, and it's like, yes, he's a clean cut guy, right? He's clean, nice shirt on. Dalton's beard was like <laughs> out here and his hair was uncut. And he just like, I wasn't sure whether to like give him a, to dad or whether he's going to smell a little funny. And I said, Dalton, like what's going on? He said, man, you're right. It's just like, it just keeps coming. And it's like, there's an exam every week and it keeps coming. And, and, and. Because my wife and I had been there, we knew that experience. She, she's a physician as well and, and went to Duke. We knew immediately that we had to like, take Dalton to some movies and, like, <laughs> and, and just break him out of the structure and, and the environment because we knew the hits that were coming and the hits that he was experiencing. And such a critical part of that mentorship was, first of all, being able to look at Dalton and say, Dalton, you look like a mess. You need to shave. <laughs> right? But also knowing how to connect him back to like, the world and reality and, and helping him to realize that the experiences he was having was normal in some ways, right? This is every doctor experiences this, but at the same time, everything that's happening to every doctor in training is totally abnormal. Like that, that is not like normal life for the other seven billion people on earth, right? So, so knowing how to, to, to sort of reconnect him in that process. So uh, his wife, Erica, she took me shopping. She, <laughs> she said, first of all, your clothes, you need some work. Your, your ties don't match your shirts. <laughs> your pants don't match your suit and your jackets. And so that was one of the ways in which she's like, okay, before you go back on the wards, let's just make sure you look nice so you feel a little bit more confident about yourself. And so that was a, an eye-opening experience because then um, I think that they understood that once I started to feel a little bit better and just gain a little bit more confidence in this whole thing, then I'll be able to really just kind of get, um, you know, hit the ground running and feel, and just that confidence in itself will just really start to resonate with myself. Now, what he didn't realize at the time was that because we'd also been in the, the hospital on training and trained students, that like there's so much about your clinical experience and pe how people perceive it and judge it in a way that's subjective. 
right? So we knew that if he presented himself with confidence and looked like clean and not like all broken down, <laughs> people would perceive his work in a way that would then incentivize it and give it value. So while he didn't realize like what, my, my wife, no, let's be honest, my wife loves to shop, oh my gosh. <laughs> she was just so happy <laughs> that somebody like, and Dalton was like paying for the stuff, but she was so happy, my wife, I won't let her pick out my clothes. She was so happy that like she got to go to Nordstrom's with somebody and pick out things. It was like an awesome experience for her. But at the same time, there was a, there was a lesson that we were teaching without words, and, and I think that that was so important. And uh, you know, I sort of have never told him that half of the story till the day I'm like mentoring from the stage, that's what I promised to do. Um, but, but, but you can see how that shaped the experience that he was having as well. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so once I started to get, I, I was going through the second year of medical school and going on my clinical rotations, and I was getting, starting to believe in myself getting that gratification for all the work that I had done prior to, and things just clicked. I was able to then really have these beautiful experiences on the wards and have really great connections with my patients and then see where my, my, where my position was then going to like work. How, just being a medical student of running back and forth and saying, hey, the patient did this, what do I do next? And they're like, all right, just you know, put it ordered in, figure it out. I was like, okay, cool, no problem. But I was now a part of the team I was able to ask questions, and then I was, that's when everything started to make sense to me. And when it was during my psychiatry rotation, and also during a palliative care rotation, I was able to see how the medical structure, the structure of the hospital was not only affecting the patient, but also affecting the family members. And that's when I had another point where I came back to Kaufman and I said, how do you navigate this? Because there's a lot, only a lot of scientific questions, a lot of medical knowledge that's necessary, but then there's also a lot of family member interactions that are going on here. And so I continuously ask them, what about you? Did anything happen to you personally that led to this? How did you really start to pick up on these notes? How did you? Yeah, I mean, so it was, it was fascinating. And I, I've talked about this a little bit in, in person. But I had a remarkable set of experiences when I was in graduate school. And so I was working in a research lab. Uh, the focus was neuroprosthetics, so hooking robotic body parts up to the brain. So this the idea that you can have, like lose your arm, but get a new robotic arm that you can move by thinking about it, an area called neuroprosthetics. And I had family members that started having like major psychiatric illness. And, and, and I certainly never appreciated at the time that there was like that much <laughs> going on in my family. It's not something that was talked about pretty broadly. But I, I immediately shifted my career and started focusing it on the idea that we can create neuroprosthetics to treat neuropsychiatric illness. So the idea that we can create brain machine devices, these would be pacemakers for the brain, that we can then use to target things like anxiety disorder or autism or Alzheimer's. And, and, and so as I, that, that shift happened for me, I realized like how profound that impact of mental illness was having on family members. And so as uh, I'm sure um, most of you know, 20 to 30% of Americans um, annually suffer from a neuropsychiatric disorder, not something we generally talk about. But what's so unique about these disorders is they typically don't just affect an individual. These are disorders, everything from addiction to depression to anxiety. Um, they, they affect the whole family. Right? And, 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 and so there's such this, this, this profound effect where, one, we're not talking about it, but it's also having a profound effect on, on people's families. So as I was training in psychiatry, I realized how important it was to engage the family um, and to begin to have these conversations with family members and how much hope research provided for the family members of, of people with psychiatric illness as well. So this was an experience that um, we made it a point. We I make it a point to talk about this um, very openly in my lab um, and, and, and instill this, it's not just answering a question. Like physician, like scientists have the responsibility of answering questions, it's really cool, right? But there's this additional burden on physician scientists which is translating cures, right? We actually do things that dramatically change the course of people's lives and, and that's something I, I, I want people to understand both the opportunity and the privilege of doing that but the weight that comes along with it, right? And, and, and I, I didn't want Dalton to leave that experience saying, oh my gosh, I, I talked to the family, I feel better, right? Part of the challenge was actually to get him to feel that weight and that burden of holding somebody's life in his hands and people expecting him to go in to work and to solve something, right? We work way more hours uh, than we should, right? And, and 
the driver in that, especially for the people that I train in my lab, is you have to feel the weight of the burden of people's lives, right? We get up and we go to work because people depend on us. People are hoping that we will be successful and that we'll deliver treatments and cures to them. And so I, 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 I increase people's ability to handle that responsibility. It's not something you can do. It's like a 15, 16, 17, 18 year old. You just, you have to, it's like going to the gym, right? You have to get your muscles of holding other people's hope and expectation and their pain. You have have to make those muscles stronger. And so it's something I work with all the students in my lab on. Yeah, and so once I realized that kind of, I got that emotional valence out of things and started to realize where my path would lead me to, um, I was then recharged. As you can see, like this, this isn't linear. It's not like I learned and got gratification and every single day things got better. It's this this path where I, I was overestimated and got a little full of myself and then got slapped back down and then learned from my mistakes and got a little bit better and then got slapped back down. But the important part was during those, each one of those valleys was that I was able to turn to somebody and say, hey man, like, how do you do this? How do you navigate this system? Why do I see these things and like, how can I then like make differences in, if, at this stage in my career? Um, and th so this kind of brings me to now, I'm entering my second year of graduate school in the, um, in the MD-PhD program. So I'm four years in. Um, and when I joined the lab, I had told them, you know, where do I start? I'm interested in asking or answering these questions. Um, and then he said, just go. What, find out what you're interested in. Do some background reading and figure out what you want to do. And that approach, um, little did he, uh, maybe he probably already knew, honestly. Um, but that really resonated with me because now I've got the ownership of my own, very own, very own designed uh, PhD project where I get to see where I'm, you know, where I need to make adjustments and where I'm not answering certain questions or being really agnostic to certain things. But each and every single time I'm learning something, it's my project. And I'm able to present the work as, this is the work that I'm doing, this is my project, I'm not doing this for anybody else, except for hopefully my future patients and their families, as well as, you know, and, you know throughout that entire experience. Yeah, it was, a, and I hope we're doing okay on time. I don't have a clock, all right, all right, great. Okay. <laughs> so it, it was actually a pretty fascinating experience. So in the time between when Dalton finished undergrad and was going through medical school, um, and the time he showed up somewhere shaven again. I, I, I had been spending a lot of time in my lab building a data science component. So I'd been hiring a lot of people who do data science in my lab. So these are like statisticians, computer scientists, computer engineers, because we were gathering all this data and we had to figure out how to analyze it. So half my lab was now sort of like biology and the other half was data science. And I woke up one day and I was like, I'm a psychiatrist, right? So I like things to work together. I'd done like, I'd learned how to do family therapy for a year. I woke up one day and I was like, my lab doesn't know how to talk to itself, right? Like, it's like two totally different languages in the same lab. And I, it, it occurred to me that nobody was training like incoming grad students to bridge the divide, right? And so there was like no translator of these two languages in my lab. And I woke up one morning and I was like, man, I need some grad students who can translate. But like nobody in undergrad gets training on how to like do all of these things. It just like really doesn't exist. And I knew it would take me sort of years to get going and to make this lab work. And then like Dalton like shows up clean shaven one day and it occurs to me, hey, wow, I must be like an amazing mentor. I've actually trained the person who can come into my lab and be my grad student. And, and I think what's so important um, for all of you as, as undergrads and, and mentees is that your mentors actually get something out of you, right? And, and, and it's, it's important uh, for you. You don't have to go in there and say that, right? Um, you, and your mentors won't always be aware of it, but when it happens, be sure to acknowledge it and point it out to them, right? Don was showing up in my lab as the exact thing I needed for my lab to work, right? He had this perspective. He was an engineer. He'd gone through med school. So in, in, in some way, Dalton went from being sort of like a really cool project, which he's a cool guy and he's a cool project, um, to, to being on a remarkable investment, right? Um, and an investment that was, it was clear he was going to show remarkable returns as well. And, and I think it's really important for you guys as, as students to make your yourself feel when you're when you're identifying a mentor to make yourself feel like a really good investment that will show return at some point in time yeah and um, I couldn't at least from the like from the mentee perspective again this will probably resonate more to the undergrads that had completed your summer experiences here but not every student is the right mentee for somebody also not every mentor is you know is the right one for you 
And so having, it's, it's a conversation, it goes back and forth, and it's really important to find out what resonates with you and what, what allows for you to get the knowledge that's necessary and also someone that can help you through those tough times. Um, I've met a lot of really impressive people going through medical school and having conversations that led, at the end of that conversation, didn't give me that kind of rise up, oh, I need to do something now. It didn't get me like, you know, excited and jazzed about certain things. And so being able to find out what resonates with you or at least being open to seeing where that, that relationship and conversations can take you, it's really important. So again, I'll, I can't stress this enough. Someone will give a talk, someone will teach a class, and, I'll, and you'll say to yourself, I'll, I'm one of many students that want to meet with them or send an email or have, go to office hours. But if you do that and you continuously show up, if you show up and work hard, you have no idea where that'll take you. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah, so we'll, we'll open up for questions, but... Yep. Yes. Can, can I just finish with yeah. one one or two final thoughts? Um, so I, I, I totally agree with Dalton. I, I, I use this term and everyone laughs, but um, because I don't mean it with all seriousness, but you should stalk your mentors, right? <laughs> like you, you should find them. Don't don't wait till they find you. Okay, so there, there are two things that you could probably see this, uh, but I, I want to say it very clearly, that frame Dalton's desire relationship. It's our agreement, right? The first one is that it is my sole objective to make him better than me, right? My second objective is to be the best myself, <laughs> which, which is sort of not entirely compatible with my second objective of making him better than me, right? And both of these things coexist all of the time in our relationship. He gets better because I want to be better, and I want to make him better, and he will be better because he has the thing that I didn't have, which is a better version of me, <laughs> right? All right, what questions do you guys have? So I'll give you a really funny answer for that, right? His parents <laughs> ask me, and then I ask him, right? So, so his parents know how to get in touch with me when necessary, and so I, they certainly talk to him, right? But when there's a worry, most of my mentees' parents will reach out to me, <laughs> right? So they are able to still be parents, but it's because they know somebody can serve as that bridge in that gap, right? I mean, people don't go from being full adults from like 18 to like 23, right? There's actually still brain development happening uh, until later. And so the, the, the switch that our society says of them being under your care to not is like not entirely matching with brain development. So yeah, parents can also touch the mentor. And I had a really great conversation with my parents um, at a certain point. They would always ask, hey, are you, are you studying and all these other things? But I've, I told them, you know, this is what I want to do. I've made it this far, and you've been such a great support for me throughout that. So if I want, I will be studying. So now they've actually just started asking me questions. Are you eating, and are you sleeping <laughs> on a regular basis? Yeah, and so just making sure that I'm taking care of myself because I told them that I will be sure to get the science thing worked out. Yeah, in about mm -hmm. two years, he's going to get that. Are you dating? Are you engaged? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> So I actually gave a talk at the MD-PhD uh, forum. Line. So it's a little bit of a longer answer, right? But the framing of this is I normally, like, I'm, I don't fit in most places. And, like, it just, it just doesn't work for me, right? And so I start most processes assuming that systems aren't built for people like me. And so I'm going to have to approach things differently. So I always start by saying, how can I build something that works for me? And then I have a good amount of mentors, I articulate to them, shape it up, and then they help me articulate it to other people, right? So one of my mentors was the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health who helped me design this program. And then, you know, I, he can sell things to people that I can't because the person he needs to sell it to is himself, right? Yeah. 
So I, I mean, I, I stalk mentors to be, yeah. Yeah, so, so I'll give you a great example of this. Um, every time I get a talk, I give out you know, 10, 15 cards. And um, so 20 people ask for a talk. I give out 10, 15 cards. Um, 10 of them might email. Um, there will probably be one person who's willing to email two or three times. And that's always the person that ends up in my lab as my mentee. Right? So I'm super busy, which means that it has to be, a, for me, right? For, for me to successfully mentor somebody, it has to be somebody who's persistent and wants it. And so it's not like I have a screening process. It's just my life sort of like screens people who can work with my life, right? Every mentor is different, right? And some mentors want to meet you, you know, they'll meet you in the library and talk to you. Some will meet you on the subway. Every person is different, right? I think mentors, if they're going to do, if, if a mentee wants a mentor to do right by them, they should figure out how to adapt their life around the mentor and not expect the mentor to adapt their life around them. So this is actually prompted by the fact that Delta and I had met a few months ago at a conference. Um, and this world gets smaller and smaller the longer you're in it. Um, so we talked about mentorship that have some more generational differences, I guess. My curiosity is for you, for your peers that you've had in the same track that have been with you through medical school, graduate school, clinical training, how do you continue to support each other and mentor each other um, throughout this path? Yeah, so we all talk to each other. A lot, right? And it, it, so it, the one thing that's been a little strange about me is my peers have all become very weird, right? Because like it was sort of full-time residents, and then I had junior faculty peers that were all—it's it, just been a little bit all over the place. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything from writing papers to giving each other's grants to giving each other encouragement, like when you know, eighty percent of stuff fails, who really does in science? Um, and, and so the peer group becomes very important. You exchange mentoring styles with students, right? Like I, and I, it's because I approach mentoring like a scientific experiment, so I try things out, right? So I try, I try one way to motivate a student, it doesn't work, I'll try something else. <coughs> but so I get a lot of the best from my peers and I stay in touch with them. Yeah, but there, I mean, there is a lot of difference in how the generations mentor things, right? I, I, I've decided that I'm going to be like the best recruiter of millennial energy. <laughs> and, and, and so my lab does a really good job of recruiting like undergrads into the lab now, right? And, and even the MD PhD students that do who don't join my lab, right? Because I like listen to the same music as the most people. Right? So. Um, so I'm curious about the What sort of things do you feel like <clears throat> So this is going to sound like a really strange one, but it's so common sense. Listen, right? So if, if you like, it's like every coach and every athlete, right? If if the athlete doesn't want to listen to the coach, the coach is going to say, "Find a new coach," right? So make it easy to mentor. That I mean, that's the most important thing. People will continue to give if you're working hard and you're making it easy to mentor. Right? And then this is really important. Give your mentor all the credit for everything. Everything. <laughs> Any positive thing that ever happens to you, it's all because of the problem. And they'll continue to do it. Because, like, you know, mentors like everybody else are driven by what the people look, right? And so when you invest in something and it gives a return, you invest more and more and more. Like, oh man, look, oh man, I got talk about getting into the MBPSC programs everywhere. What are we going to do next, right? Cool. Um, so you were talking about how you want the um, biological side of your lab and the more statistics side of your lab to have better communication and better coherent um, yeah. working together. So what exactly did having Dalton in your lab do for that communication? Yeah, so something as simple as machine learning, right? So most of the book, let's give you something to use here. The word model, right? So the word model went, meant one set of things to biologists and a whole other set of things to the machine learning things, right? And so it was, I mean, we had these covered lab meetings that would go nowhere until I realized that the same word meant two different things, right? So the, the utility is people who can understand both sides of an issue to understand what is the clinical relevance, right? Because <laughs> some of the best data scientists in my lab can't actually tell you why what they're doing is important for a clinician. But none of our like neuroscience problems can be solved without the work that they do, right? It's just, it's totally a standstill. So part of it is being able to understand and articulate the importance 
And then also just allowing one side to speak to another, right? So you want to develop solutions that matter. Then people have to understand, you know, this is sort of data science world. This is where it's going to get you. Because the answer in their field is different than the answer in your field. So Dalton is one of those in my lab. Now. He's not like one of, you know, a, a list of two or three people we brought into the, but who can sit at the, the center of that conversation. And if I might just add uh, to that, at the end of the day, the end of PhD, is serving that function between the lab and the lab. But I think at this point, I would thank both of you very much.